I'm so glad to have Anna Tobin here with us from the Teton Raptor Center. Uh, they're going to be talking to us about the amazing project that they're doing, uh, uh, their Poo Poo Project. And so uh, without further ado, I'll leave it to Anna. Thank you. Hi, thank you so much. Um, I'm so excited to be here. And let me go ahead and start sharing my screen. And just Caitlin, can you confirm really quick? It looks good. Perfect. So as Caitlin said, I am the education coordinator at Teton Raptor Center, and I'm beyond delighted today to talk to you about Teton Raptor Center and the Poo Poo Project, especially because I used to be a part of the VINS team, as well as a few of our other staff here at TRC. So we really appreciate the opportunity to continue to collaborate with VINS. So throughout this presentation, I will have the ability for questions at the end, but if you guys have a question or anything throughout, want me to clarify, uh, feel free to ask. I'm here. I'm happy to answer any questions and I love interaction. So let's go ahead and get started. So a little bit about us. Who is the Teton Raptor Center? We were founded by Roger Smith and Margaret Creel. They are both field biologists and researchers in the area who recognize a need for raptor conservation. And so we were founded in 1991, which means we are a little bit younger than Vince. Um, and we are located in Jackson Hole, Wyoming. Um, we have our mission, which is advancing raptor conservation through education, research, and rehabilitation. And if you guys know Vins, you know the three-pronged approach. You're very familiar with that. And our vision is to keep wild birds wild. And so our, among our three-pronged uh, approach, our research team has over 12 active projects going on right now, ranging from golden eagle trapping and banding during migration to bioacoustic research of great gray owls. We are researching all over the greater Yellowstone ecosystem. We have an incredible team that um, continues to be published and are doing really great work. Next up, our rehabilitation. We get over 170 patients every single year, and we are permitted to work, rehab raptors and corvids. So we're going to have a smaller amount than what Vince has, but uh, we have a, a little bit of a different specialization. Um, and then in our education team, we currently have 11 avian ambassadors that travel across Idaho, Wyoming, and Montana to educate about raptors. And if you are in the area, we encourage you to visit, especially since we are opening up our new education center. Our campus is close to completing a four-year renovation project of the historic Mosley Ranch. And on June 1st, we will be opening our doors to the public with brand new capacity. While it's no canopy walk, um, we are really excited and we've been working on this for a really long time and we're excited to provide a world-class research rehabilitation and education center. So here's a little mock-up of our center right here. So you can see it's a whole campus, we're really excited. And again, I encourage you to visit. So with that in mind, something that is vital to Teton Raptor Center is actually where we are located. As I mentioned before, we are based in Jackson Hole, which is actually within the greater Yellowstone ecosystem. So here's a map of that ecosystem. It spans Montana, Idaho, and Wyoming. It's one of the largest nearly intact temperate zone ecosystems on Earth. Um, greater Yellowstone's diversity of natural wealth includes hydrothermal features, wildlife, vegetation, lakes, and geological wonders like the Grand Canyon of the Yellowstone River, which you didn't know there were two Grand Canyons, but there definitely are. Um, the terrain is covered with snow for much of the year. There is still a ton of snow outside right now, but we may be hitting 50 degrees this weekend. So keep your fingers crossed because we're a little tired of snow right now. Um, and it supports forests dominated by lodgepole pine and interspersed with alpine meadows. Um, we also have sagebrush ste uh, steppe and grassland at lower elevation, which provides essential winter forage for elk, bison, and bighorn sheep, which are very iconic to this area. It is also the most diverse place in the lower 48 to see raptors, with over 30, uh, 30 species either living or migrating through. The next up is Alabama. They have 16. And we have a diversity of ecosystems largely due to protected lands that include state lands, two national parks, portions of five national forests, um, three national wildlife refuges, Bureau of Land Management Holdings, private and tribal lands. So this means we have upwards of 22 million acres of protected land to support biodiversity, including our raptor species. 
So at any day, our view can look a little something like this, which is really special. Um, and all of these protected lands help attract people to the area to interact with and observe nature. And that means that we have to have infrastructure to support all of this ecotourism. And one thing that every person has in common, including tourists, is that when they visit, they need to use a bathroom, funnily enough, uh, which brings us to the project that we're going to be talking today. And it's about, it's called the Poo Poo Project. So this, the Poo Poo Project is also known as the Porta Potty Owl Project. And it is in response to a recognized need. So people servicing the vault toilets from different agencies were finding animal skeletons and carcasses in the vault toilets. And at TRC, we were getting patients, um, birds that had been uh, stuck in these vault toilets since the day one of our rehab. Um, so this project prevents cavity nesting birds from entering vault toilets through the ventilation pipes and becoming trapped. It is also a model for direct conservation project with a big impact. It is also a great model of citizen science, which I know Vince is very fond of. This is one of those really awesome citizen science projects that everyone can be involved in, and I'll explore that a little bit more in the future. So if you've been to a national park, if you've been outside, you know what a vault toilet looks like. Um, it is more glamorous than a porta potty, in my opinion, but it still does the job either way. Um, and so you'll see the vault toilet design has an open ventilation pipe, um, and there can be one to two pipes per toilet. And that ventilation is vital because you do not want to be in an enclosed space and not have any ventilation if you're using it as a bathroom. So that airflow is really important for sanitation and just, you know, human health. Um, the ventilation pipe opens at 12 feet above ground, and then underneath are two 1,000 gallon vaults below the ground. And the situation is, is owls enter through the pipes and become trapped in the vault below. So try to pick out where there might be wildlife in this photo. Any guesses? I can give you guys five seconds. I'll show you right there. Not doing so great. That's a little boreal owl. There's a little close up on them. And there they are coming out of the vault toilet. So it is in a super unpleasant situation to be in. So this is a situation where this is not a heavily studied um, field. In fact, if anybody wants to get funding to go study animals trapped in vault toilets, I highly encourage you to do so. I don't know how much of your funding you want dedicated to changes of clothing and um, masks to make sure that it doesn't smell too bad when you're studying. But there is a ton of anecdotal evidence of this happening. Many companies that would service the toilets um, talked about removing live and dead animals and mammal carcasses and birds. And you can even see this little sign here that says, you know, don't use this toilet. There is an owl in there and we're leaving it open for that owl to come out. So this was something that was just talked about among the community for a very long time. And it was all anecdotal until started, people started to gather that information and continue to communicate with each other. And just because an issue is anecdotal doesn't mean we can't come up with a solution because sometimes there is a clear solution, as we'll talk about in just a second. So many different types of species of cavity nesting wildlife, including raptors, get trapped in here. So from barn owls to great grays to kestrels. Again, we have a ton of these photos, and I'm sorry that I hope no one's eating when you're watching this presentation. So... In this situation, we're seeing a sawwet and a long-eared owl. Um, as we mentioned before, vault toilets act as cavities, and cavity nesting birds prefer dark, narrow spaces for nesting and roosting. They become entrapped and die in vertical open pipes, dryer vents, fest fence posts, mining claim stakes, old irrigation pipes, and chimneys. And they can be these vault toilets can be found in many of America's wilderness and uh, especially featuring ventilation pipes, that causes the animals to just get stuck. They succumb to dehydration, starvation, or disease. So how do we know this? 
besides the anecdotal evidence is we have a ton of case studies from it. So let's talk about the first case study. Do you guys remember this photo that you saw just a second ago, a little barn owl? Um, this was a case study of a barn owl trapped in a pit of a vault toilet in Morgan Hill, California. Um, and they were found actually by an employee that was servicing the toilet. Um, the nonprofit organization, WERC, came out. They are a wildlife rehab organization in that area. And they quickly got the barn owl out of there. So there he is coming out of the vault toilet. There he is getting dried off. And after time that was spent in their care, they actually successfully released the barn owl back into the wild. Um, and this owl was incredibly lucky, unlike the case study we have next, which is actually one of our own. So long-eared owl 8-10-18 was found in a vault toilet in West Yellowstone, pictured here, and it was unknown how much time they spent there. You can see in this photo, the state of the, its feathers um, that they were in. And so it was brought back to our rehab where we bathed them and provided treatment to try and stabilize them. Um, soiled and wet feathers prevent a bird from flying. Also, without flight, they're unable to protect themselves from escaping other predators, hunting, and other natural important functions. Furthermore, human waste is considered a biohazard. I know that's shocking, but it is. Um, and it's important to remove all contaminants from bird feathers and body parts in an effort to remove all biohazard hazard contaminants as soon as possible. Disease is also present in human waste um, and removing it swiftly is important for a bird's stabilization process. Once all waste and contaminants are removed, patients need to be placed on a broad spectrum of antibiotics um, since they most likely had feces in their eyes, mouth, or other cavities. Um, removing this type of debris is crucial su for survival. So unfortunately, as you know, not every rehab story is going to be a success. And this bird passed away within 24 hours from shock due to the intensive care that was needed and the cleaning to remove all of that biohazard material. So this was despite our team's best efforts. And, you know, this was totally a possible situation, like many of the animals that are never found, that we wouldn't have known about this until someone called us and started doing that research. So, all of these stories from those managing the vault toilets and from the birds entering our rehab really hammered home that a solution was needed sooner rather than later. So, how do we fix this problem? One is looking at rock screens. Rock screens are designed to prevent people from throwing rocks into the pipes, using it for target practice. If you've ever been with teenagers on a road trip, you probably know that they're going to throw things if they want to. So cover the vents without impeding ventilation of the pipe. This solution already existed in these rock screens. So in 2010, um, we applied for a local grant, 1% of the Tetons, to purchase 100 rock screens. Um, the screens were actually pretty expensive at approximately $100 a piece. And so our team went out and we organized a group of staff and volunteers from TRC to install 100 screens in Teton County as a pilot project. It took one day to screen 100 pipes. So pretty effective. And that includes all the driving around and all the different managing. So really, you kind of need someone with a ladder, someone to hold that ladder, and someone up to stand on those pipes and just screw them in. So we found that very successful. But there was still a problem. We realized that it was simple, easy, and engaging for our supporters, but the, uh, the cost of the rock screen was prohibitive. So we designed a more effective but less expensive screen through a local manufacturer. And in 2013, the Poo Poo Project was officially born. And since its inception, we have had a staff member dedicated to this project as a part of our team. So here is a few of the different models uh, that the Poo Poo Project has gone through. Our original Poo Poo Project screen featured an owl design cutout of a powder cold, uh, coated steel screen. And so the goal of these screen designs were effective, easy to package and ship, inexpensive, lightweight, and visually non-obtrusive. We want them to be accessible. And that means accessible to install, accessible to afford, and you know, 
I don't know anyone who would get bothered by the aesthetic of a poo-poo screen, but just in case we wanted them to look aesthetically pleasing as well. Um, the screen also featured one inch elevation to allow ventilation to occur, even if debris buildup such as snow got stuck on top. And there's a lot of places where there can be a ton of buildup of snow. So you can kind of see the first iterations of this poo poo project screen. And so one of the concerns that we wanted to work through is whether or not small birds could still get in, stuck in these screens or even bats. But we actually know that bats crawl upwards into cavities. They are not coming downwards. And the one inch gap is actually slightly less than an inch. And it is a minimum size to keep small birds out, but to allow ventilation. And this is, as I mentioned, supposed to be a relatively easy solution. And so we have four self-tapping screws that are needed to install a screen. The only installation you need, a drill as well, maybe. Next up, our design was vetted by biologists and engineers at USDA Forest Service and Missoula Tech. And the Poo Poo Project screens were also featured in national tech tip detailing best practices for the installation of screens on vault toilets. And then this document was distributed throughout the Forest Service because there's no use creating a solution if people don't know about it and they don't know how to install it correctly. So right off the bat, our goal was to get the message out as soon as possible, because again, this is not rocket science in terms of a conservation project, and it's only going to be effective if we all work together. So here are actually some of our partners. Partners are people who purchase the screens or include volunteers to install the screens. And so we have Autobahn Societies, Boys and Girl Scouts and Eagle Scouts, Bureau of Land Management, National Park Service, U.S. Forest Service, State Parks, the public. We have over 3,000 sponsored screens by the public. In Vermont, we have the U.S. Forest Service, Green Mountain National Forest, Manchester Ranger District, and I'm going to say this horribly, I'm so sorry, U.S. Fish uh, Wildlife Service, Missaqua, I'm so sorry, um, National Wildlife Refuge. And with Vermont being known for its natural beauty and abundant hiking opportunities, you would think that there would be actually a large presence of screens, but we checked for this presentation there are only 20 poo-poo screens in the state of Vermont. So hopefully this presentation today will change that because uh, Vermont's got a lot of toilets. I know, I live there. And so there's a lot of opportunities for animals to become entrapped, which also means a lot of solutions to stop that from happening. So the results also include classroom partnerships since some of our partners are a little less traditional and this project is something that can be participated by all ages and by all different backgrounds and we've had classrooms sponsor screens and even create original art like this so if you aren't convinced by these masterpieces then i'm not sure what will convince you at this point because we have had a huge community effort with it which is really really exciting so the results of since 2013, we have gone through several iterations of the design and finally have landed on a new and improved stainless steel screen, the Poopoo Screen 2.0. You that is the image that you see right here. The reason why we for went without the owl design is it became cost prohibited. That special custom art cost more money than it would be to produce this kind of netted screen style. And again, we want this to be accessible to everyone. And and speaking of accessible to everyone, you guys remember that um, center in California that rescued the barn owl trapped in the vault toilet? After that happened, uh, we got in touch and they installed multiple screens at the location that the owl was trapped. Um, this story of the bird getting trapped is not unique to this area, the greater Yellowstone ecosystem. Um, and it also means that the solution can be just as successful and accessible elsewhere. The standard 12 inch screen, stainless steel, stainless steel poo poo screens are durable, they're easy to install, they provide superior ventilation, and I know because we have tested many, many different models for that, they can be a little gross in the testing processes, but necessary, and they're more affordable at only $34.50 per screen. We have actually reached all 50 states. 
areas in Canada and the U.S. Virgin Islands. We have 658 partners and over 19,000 screens distributed since our founding in 2013. And the results are, ooh, in 2014, we were awarded the United States Forest Service Wings Across America Conservation Award for Habitat Management and Partnership. And we have presented on the Poo Poo Project at the International Association of Avian Trainers Conference, as well as the Wildlife Society Conference. And this project has been being pushed by a ton of different organizations. That's why we're so excited Vins wanted us to be a part of this, because you don't know until we kind of get that information out there. It's the classic conservation story. Um, and it, there's not many conservation stories out there that have a simple solution, and this one does. So if you actually look at this map, all of these pins represent areas in which our screens can be found. So there are a lot of them, and there is also a lot of blank space, which means continual opportunities to create more conservation options. So the future of the Poo Poo Project. We have a ton of room to expand. Going back to that map, Canada is pretty blank. So we are looking to expand more into Canada. Um, and that again, just comes through communication and awareness and spreading the message and getting people involved and aware. Um, in 2019, we switched over to stainless steel. So we actually have to go back and replace the older models as they start to rust. Um, and so that is going to be an ongoing project. Our goal is to leave no vault vent, toilet vent uncapped. Um, we also want to expand to other types of pipes. So we don't want to stop at vault toilets. We want to look at chimneys and stakes and make sure that if there is a cavity nesting opportunity that is potentially hazardous to wildlife, then we can find ways to prevent that from happening with, of course, always providing alternative cavity nesting. Put up your owl boxes. Just a reminder, put up those kestrel boxes. We also want to expand the development of custom screens. We are always looking to innovate how this is being produced in different ways. So we want to make sure that we can find ways to be even more cost effective in the future. The more information the gather, we gather, the better we will be. And we want to continue engaging the public, the partners, and you. Our main goal is to get these screens on vault toilets at the manufacturing level before they even go out. And again, this comes from communication, from public input, from public support. And conservation is actually most successful when everyone can be a part of it at some level. So if you notice any uncapped pipes, drop a pin and get in touch with us. We have multiple links on our website that you can follow. And you'll see that we have over 600 partners, as I mentioned before. And so we are continuing to expand. This is only going to be a growing movement as people become more interested in nature, which is great as they want to go out, as we build more infrastructure. This is an opportunity to start protecting wildlife, especially if we do it at the manufacturing level, then wildlife doesn't have to, we don't have to lose wildlife if we put those screens on top before any problem happens. So if you want to get involved today, you can sponsor a screen. And it was only $45 to sponsor, and that includes shipping and installation costs. And for a lot of these areas, costs can be prohibitive to them because they are a governmental organization. They might not get the best funding. They're a nonprofit organization. They might not get the best funding. It might not be in their budget to install these things. So you can actually sponsor them as a gift for someone who has everything. And I have sponsored it for multiple Father's Day gifts. So it is a good option for that. And if you want to be a poo-poo warrior, you can visit your screen in person once it's installed and take a selfie and spread that message. I guarantee if you look up the hashtag poo-poo warrior, it is very confusing and it is only Teton Raptor Center people right now. But we can spread that message. And again, conservation is most successful when everyone can be a part of it. And it doesn't always have to be a big, complicated solution. It can be a very simple solution that everyone can access. Anyone from, you know, two years old going out and pointing that out to 98 years old plus, this is something we can all do. And we can't do it without you guys. So I'm really thankful that you showed up here today. 
And I want to make sure to answer any questions you have. And before we get too far, this is Manzana, our barn owl, and she or she is testing out the feasibility of the poo poo screen. She is an excellent tester for us. So I know it's a short and sweet presentation, but sometimes you don't need a ton of background in science to make an effective conservation message. And so I'm happy to answer any questions you guys might have. Well, thank you so much, Anna. That was really interesting. Um, let's see if we have any questions. Go to I think there was one question about um, a bit, or you you had mentioned um, you had mentioned the potential for the manufacturing side of things. So, uh, has that been? So the question is, did no one think about the, the problem when the ventilation pipes were originally installed? Uh, and so have you seen kind of uh, more, has your, has your question about manufacturing been effective so far? Like, have you been successful on that front? We're building conversations and I don't know who patented vent toilets, so I can't <laughs> ask them whether or not they thought of that in the beginning, but I think it's indicative that they thought of a problem by creating rock screens to stop people from throwing rocks into the vault toilets. Um, but that is a human-based problem. That is not a wildlife-based problem. So in terms of our conversations, they are happening. In the end, it is, again, cost prohibitive to some organizations. And for some places, either they are A, not aware of the issue, or B, don't have the ability or the budget to fund new things like that. And so the conversations are happening. They continue to grow. And this is one of those situations, like with many citizen science projects, the more support from the community to uplift those conversations instead of condemn those organizations is really going to help out. And that's where we've been approaching it. We've been talking to the manufacturers to work in partnership rather than to punish them. And so far, that those conversations have been going fairly well. Um, so somebody asks, are there any regulations uh, prohibiting you from placing screens in Mexico and Canada? So is there any different rules that you're faced with in those in Canada and Mexico? Not that I am currently aware of. Usually what happens is, again, it's a citizen science project. Someone drops a pin or even an organization hears about us from another organization and reaches out. Um, again, we have designed it in a way to still allow ventilation to happen. If it was something that it was totally sealed to the screen, that would cause health issues or potential for health issues. So currently what we're encountering is again, just a lack of information and contact in those areas. And that just comes through um, communicating and messaging. But I have not heard of any regulations that have limited our ability to install them, especially because we designed them to allow for the same function of the ventilation pipe, just with some extra safety measures. Do you have any idea on the, uh, how many screens in New Hampshire? Ooh, I don't have that statistic off the top of my head. We do have a spreadsheet somewhere in our drive that has uh, the how many ventilation, uh, sorry, screens we have across all of our projects. Um, that is an over 19,000 um, kind of Excel sheet. And so I can totally <laughs> look that up and share that with you, Caitlin, if you want. Right. <laughs> but there's always room for more. We still have people in Idaho and Wyoming and Montana who are still contacting us when they're driving down and stopping at those rest stops and everything like that, who noticed that. And we've been in doing this project since 2013. So there's always opportunity for growth and, you know, no vent left uncapped is really going to be our burning motto. I love that. Um, people, yeah, so people seem to be very curious about how many in different um, states in our area. So we'll, I think we'll definitely uh, maybe collaborate on that and maybe post an Instagram or, or send out a note uh, yeah. to be like, this is the poo poo project that's in the, in our little area. And uh, let's get more <laughs> in our area yeah, for sure. We would love that. Um, and um, we're absolutely able to look in that. We also talked about creating an interactive function on our website where you can actually go to your state and have it light up about where all the screens are. So um, that is something that we have in the works, but getting those numbers to you and sharing that in a post will be faster in the short term so people can get those answers. Um, 
so this one's what are the most common species you would expect to fall victim to this issue prior to screen placement? This is convenient for the festival, but I promise not on purpose, small <laughs> owls. So those small owls, those cavity nesters, um, they are just really susceptible to that. But yes, we've had birds as large as great gray owls that go into their um, great horned owls. Uh, it's not discriminatory. Um, so it's absolutely something that it's just unfortunate because again, those cavities, the other thing is that when you have all that piping going up, human refuse creates methane. It is warm and it's warm and inviting for potential cavity nesters. So that is something that's very attractive to them, especially in areas those, um, the rest stops will be in areas that they've cleared of forested areas. And so that might be the only cavity in the area for cavity nesters to nest in. Our, um, you had mentioned uh, about encouraging people to build cavity, uh, uh, like boxes and things. Um, is that part of the poo-poo project, kind of like just having that conversation with, with, with building cavities? We always have that conversation. And I, you guys are a raptor center, so you know too, that is one of the main takeaways for many of our conservation conversations. But um, in terms of our focus, we focus on those screens and then we add additional action items as in you can build a nest box as well. Nice. Um, um, I was curious, this is might be a little bit of a gross question, but how do they get the, like, is, how do they get the owl out of the vault? You go in. You go in, wow. You go in or you, so I know there's situations where they tried to use a really long like pool net to get them out. Um, but again, that's a thousand gallon vault toilet. Um, so using a pool net with a small cavity going in is not the most successful, but a lot of times it's, uh, they go in and you know what, the people who clean them usually do have to go in anyway. So it's not, it's gross for us to experience, <laughs> um, but yeah, it's it's unfortunately a manual retrieval, which only adds to the stress of an already sick slash injured bird. Um, so if anyone wants to volunteer for that as well, yeah, we don't need it in the future. <laughs> um, yeah, so lot, yeah, kind of questions about. So this one's: Do you collaborate with Yellowstone National Park or Grand Teton National Park? So those. We do. We do. All of those vault toilets in there, if we are aware of them, there are screens on them. So it is a really, truly like a community project. And we're the only raptor center of our kind in this area. And so we do get a lot of work with um, different organizations for that in the different parks as well. And it is also, again, when you go through parks, it's a really fun game to go look at the vault toilets to see how many screens are on there. Yeah. Um, so Jeff Morris apparently is going to the Atlantic provinces of Canada. And so he says he's going to keep an eye out for those vault toilets. Uh, is there any things that you advice, do you have advice for him to, um, spread awareness when he's traveling around? Yeah. I mean, it's really, again, have those conversations and our website has all the information you need, including a fun little video where an owl narrates it. It also has the ability to sponsor a screen online. Um, we do have flyers, obviously it's a virtual presentation, so I can't hand out flyers right now, but if you just go to our website, it's very prominently there. It's easy to share. And, uh, we have is it's something that we want to make as foolproof as possible. Um, and we have someone who is going every order they get, they are packing everything out within a week and sending it off so it can be installed. And the cost that it is, is to cover not only just kind of the cost of making the screen, but making sure that it is installed and shipped as well as quickly as possible. So it's, it's one of those things that a rock screen is $100 and we wanted to create something that was more effective and more um, affordable to the general public and especially to those parks that don't always get the best funding, but do care and want to make those changes. Mm -hmm. Um, this one's, do you ever experience vandalism on the, on the, um, screen? Um, I have not heard of any stories of vandalism, but I'm not where every 19,000, 19,000s across screens. 
I think if it is possible, it has happened at some point. Um, but in terms of extreme vandalism, we have not heard of any stories of people trying to take the screens off or anything like that. Again, this is one of those situations where um, people tend to like owls and tend to like cavity nesters. And once they know the reason, they're not going to try and stop things. Always there's outliers. But for the most part, it's again, people just don't know the solution until they kind of talk about it or even if it's an issue. And once they hear what it is, uh, they want to get involved because these are very charismatic and important species. And so any vandalism that might happen, as far as I'm aware, has been minimal. And I really haven't had any conversation about vandalism. But it's a really good question. Yeah. So, so I think this, so this question, um, who is responsible for installing the screen if the need is identified outside your area? So from what I understand, you you can pin as you're traveling, as you're nearby, you can pin, and then Teton Raptor Center now is aware of this vault. Um, and then the next, what's the next step once that that happens? That's a great question. So the next step, once we are aware, is it, we will get in contact with the park or the property um, and let them know that, hey, there is a vault um, toilet with no screen. Here are the issues. And do you think you are able to afford installation? No, you. if you can't, if you can, great, that's awesome. If not, we have so many members of the public who want to sponsor screens and they have already paid for it to get sponsored. So it will just be the employees of whoever works at that area or manages that area that can install it. And again, it's, it's I would say it's a two person job because you should always have someone holding your ladder for you, um, but it can be installed within 10 minutes. Um, it's a very easy thing to do. And so it's just reliant on getting that information out to those organizations that own or manage the vault toilets. And then we pay for everything, but basically the manpower and the manpower is 10 minutes long. Great. Um, there's some discussions here about um, kind of reaching out to like Home Depot and looking at drain pipe um, kind of systems that might like composite drain inserts for $10. And what I see here, it says four to six diameter um, composite drain inserts. So from the discussion here, have you seen any kind of, um, kind of questions about, well, alternatives or, or things that other people have, have used? Um, because it sounds so from what I sorry, just because I'm reading the chat and it sounds like a little, there's a little discussion in our chat about this. Um, but these pipes that you're talking about, they're at least 12 in 10 to 12 inches, right? Yes, they're larger than the four to six inches in diameter. And again, it's because of those a thousand gallon tanks, they need a wider pipe to be able to allow any of that, um, for lack of a better term, grossness to escape. And so those smaller, thinner pipes. So the other thing is you have to think from a manufacturing standpoint, if you're going to install more smaller pipes, that is going to be more time prohibitive and potentially cost prohibitive from that manufacturing level instead of that one larger pipe that allows for better airflow. And so it's one of those things that we could try to ask the manufacturers to redesign their pipes to be smaller. So it's a cheaper installation. Um, but if we're trying to just get them to vent what they're the cap that they already are venting. So um, it is something that again, we are always um, redesigning, trying to make it more cost effective. So any of these things, this is not something we're trying to make a profit off of. We're just trying to spread out the information. Thank you for that. Yeah. Um, thanks for clarifying on that end. All right. Well, um, last question I think is just to end on what is a way that somebody should or can help you out? What is the one way you would like, would want support for Teton Raptor Center? For the Poo Poo Project specifically? Um, either way. As well, a I think in every single conservation message, spreading the message, you know, making sure that more people are aware. Because again, the, most of the time when conservation isn't happening, it's because people aren't aware that it's an issue. It is not a malicious intent. Um, and then it's making sure that the solution is as accessible as possible. It would be great if everyone here could fix climate change. I don't want to put that all on all of you, but if you can, that would be awesome. But in the meantime, you can make sure to spread this message, spread that awareness. 
Um, be aware of your surroundings. Make sure that you, and I'm speaking to the choir here, be aware of the birds in your area um, and make sure that if you notice things that are potentially going to be damaging to their ability to survive successfully in the wild, um, look for solutions. We have so many resources out there. We as a facility, VINS as a facility, um, other raptor centers. So kind of if you spread that message, if you sponsor a screen for someone's birthday and they're like, what the heck is this? You just probably talk to someone who had no idea who are hopefully going to be amused and inspired by that. And they're more willing to spread that message as well. So just keep on having that conversation. Always donating is incredibly helpful, um, but hopefully, and I know Vince feels the same way too, to a certain extent, it'd be great if we were out of a job one day um, <laughs> with all the conservation that was needed. Um, but in the meantime, you guys can help with that by sharing that. Great. Well, thank you so much, Anna, for joining us. I oh. hope you enjoy, uh, have a great rest of your evening. And thank you all for joining us as well and uh, taking part in our virtual ALF uh, celebration. Uh, and so hope to see you next week and also in person on April 15th on that Saturday. There'll be lots of live owls to see and lots of things to do on site. And so thank you all so much.